in three classes. The first this class meeting is being recorded. The first class is the tax related and commercial affairs, which deals with tax evasion, trade misinvoicing, and market manipulation. So the key terms here are things that involve tax or commercial forms of activities. The second is corruption, dealing with specifically people holding high high public official uh, cap, high seats in uh, public offices, and of course. This can be in bribery, embezzlement, illicit enrichment, and abuse of function. Of course, we can see mostly uh, these are charges that are commonly had, and we would know a bit of the examples of corruption-related affairs. Another is criminal activities. So criminal activities are divided into two, and these are exploitation type activities and illegal markets. So exploitation is in terms of slavery. So this deals with exploiting people to enrich yourself or benefit in some way. And the other is illegal markets. So selling things that are prohibited. Now, We'll also see that when it comes to classifications, these classifications now boil down to how much is being lost globally. And 2019 data showed that the money lost globally on IFFs was $1.9 trillion as of 2019, with, of course, uh, the highest outflows being, in, being from Europe and North America. Outflows in this instance means how much money was lost or was uh, transferred from those regions to other regions. So that is what outflows means when it comes to illicit financial flows. And inflows of illicit financial flows, of course, means the opposite, which is the illicit financial flows coming into that country. Now, we also see that there are different um, vulnerabilities that would make a country or region more susceptible to illicit financial flows. And one of these, uh, as can be seen in this data tracker by uh, Tax Justice Network, is we see here that the global heat map the, the one loading right now, it will come up in a bit. So the, the point of the, the heat map, of course, in this case is we are able to see how different countries are liable or identify with different illicit financial flows, which pose great risks to illicit financial flows. So for example, we are looking at the first channel here. And when looking at a data set like this, we see there are different channels. There are imports, exports, inward FDI, outward FDI. And of course, there is portfolio, there is banking positions, and all these cause, of course, illicit financial flows because these are activities that may may have an opportunity for money to be illegally transferred and or used. So when looking at inward foreign direct investment, we see that we see this heat map over here. And you can see the, the more bold colors are showing that this is a country that has been affected highly by inward foreign direct investments. And of course, when we, when we look at China, it is a global player. So that can also be um, a, a reason why it has such a vulnerability score of 65. And we can look at Kenya, which has a lower one, which was 16. And of course, it's good to look at the data here, which for this one was 2018. Now we go to these two, which are variables. So they can be the vulnerability score in terms of how much the country is susceptible to secretiveness when it comes to financial information. And of course, there's the intensity and exposure, which also talk about the importance of, of the channel. So intensity is the importance of the channel to the country. So the inward FDI could be very important to China. 
to China's GDP, which affects 20% of it. So th these are some of the things that we are seeing with illicit financial flows and how vulnerable countries are to them, however big. So another is, of course, looking at inequality. I first affect different countries and people uh, in different ways. And of course, even as we are looking at how to tackle IFFs, we also have to know that the reason why this much money is being lost on IFFs is because it's being lost, we would not have money to now uh, cater to other issues, social welfare issues of health, education, and generally promoting human rights. Now, when looking at the inequality database, we this is a database from the World Inequality Database. And of course, these databases are free and can be accessed by everyone. You'll see them on the PowerPoint as well. So for this one, we'll specifically look at the average when it comes to So this has a region and a country view. And of course, you can look at how the country has been affected by, you know, average income per adult to national income. So of course, again, we can see how bold some of the countries are when it comes to the national income average. And of course, as, as we look at the income inequality, we can see how different regions are again impacted differently. And in this case, you'll be able to see that the top 10% share in each country, looking at the region view here, we can see the global south is, of course, affected uh, negatively in this way. And of course, in such a situation, that's why glo the global south would be at an advantage in, uh, in tackling IFFs. Now, going back to the statistics and how, uh, and how we can see IFFs affecting different countries, we look at the challenges in IFFs. So the first, the biggest challenge is defining IFFs because of how broad IFFs are, the activities, the different, the, so the, the different. If it may, sorry, uh, to me. ensure that the online audience is not kind of a an afterthought, but. All right. So here we are looking at IFFs definitions and the challenges that they have. And the first one is when it comes to the data available. I've shown you two different data sets and I've also shown you some of the figures lost in 2019. And what you could see is if you look at the, that data, it could be uh, unreliable in some way due to marginal errors and contradictory analysis when it comes to the data available. And that is one of the reasons uh, that the defining IFFs is, is a big problem. And so the challenges in defining IFFs are in four big categories. The first one is there's a challenge in linking money movements with your contracted goods and services. And of course, there's the second one which deals with the digital economy transactions and cash-based informal economy transactions and finally, unknown data on criminal activities. And when you look at these four areas, we can see that either the data may not be there or the data is there, but different people have different estimates of it. Now, we also continue on to look at another challenge, which is in terms of law. And when it comes to law, there are different laws for each jurisdiction. And there's also a big problem when it comes to the consensus of international organizations bringing together countries to have uniform laws around IFFs. Now, one of the key laws in this issue, one of the key areas in this issue, I'm sorry, I'm seeing a comment here uh, about the screen. Can you see my presentation? 
Yes, go ahead, Verita. Okay. Okay, so as I was saying, there's one legally binding universal anti-corruption instrument, which is the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. So with that in mind, we have to realize that when it comes to this uh, instrument, it has some problems or rather it is not aligned to what other countries, to what countries have, to, to what countries agree with and the case here that uh, we can see is the FIFA case of 2015. So this was a case where uh, no one was charged with corruption as a standalone charge, but we saw that the officials were charged with racketeering, wire fraud, money laundering, and other offenses. And in the US at the time, what they had to do was take two key instruments which was the racketeering, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act and the Travel Act. And with these two instruments, they were able to then charge these individuals with racketeering, wire fraud, money laundering conspiracies. And with the Travel Act, that is where they were able to bring in the bribery charge, which you can see there not all countries are able to now bring together uh, different instruments in order to, to prohibit such activities. So in this case, we are looking at other instances where there are laws, but there's limited to no enforcement. And so what that does is that the data in these cases will not be included when it comes to IFF estimates. So with that in mind, we see one thing. There's no clear consensus on defining IFFs and it brings now a problem to estimating the data on IFFs and even less now measuring them. So with that in mind, we look at a very interesting case study of money laundering. And the first, the first area of money laundering that you see as a big issue is now the collection. So this is the process of money laundering, wherever that money came from. So it is first collected, then it is placed in a financial institution. So the first point is now taking the illegal money and bringing it into the illicit economy through a financial institution, or as we talked about transactions earlier, it can be cash-based again. So finally, it is brought into the financial system, and that is where the washing is, is now done well. And in this case, it's called layering. And what that does is through a consecutive steps of changing back bank accounts, invoices, or wire transfers, the money can now be integrated again into now the, the very original owner of the money. So here, uh, we are seeing that it moved from bank accounts, there was a wire transfer, it could have even been a loan to another com company, or just a false invoice. And the money will still be used in the licit economy and sometimes it is also used to finance criminal activities. So with the introduction of the digital economy, uh, kindly note this specific area here. The method is the same in all money laundering cycles, the process is the same, but when it comes to now the activities in each process, they may differ and have different complexities. For example, in this case, we can see here the use of digital uh, systems and currencies in this situation. And finally, we can also see in this third case where there is the introduction of a middleman. So the politician has uh, money, talks to a middleman who now brings in a lawyer or it can even be an accountant or any other non-state actor who is a professional. And 
here is what we talked about inflated legal invoices so here it can either be false invoice or inflated where the price is more than the service or there could even be no service and so what that does is that the lawyer in this case will now take the the cut as a fee and then reintegrate that money into the bank and the politician then gets this money back so and in many cases actually you'll find that these are the, these are the kind of situations that happen now when when we're looking at the measurement and prediction on ifs so we've we've talked about the first part which was more of what are IFFs, the, the definitions and classifications and the various activities that can be uh, done. And of course, the estimates, how much are we losing to IFFs? So the second is measuring and predicting IFFs. And when we're measuring and predicting IFFs, there are two main methods that are used. And the first one is the econometrical. So the econometrical, uh, methodology looks into comparing aggregate data of licit activity. So this is activity that is either tax or trade related, right? It is from a licit activity. And then somehow it got now into the illicit so in this method, it's looking at that data, the aggregated data of the licit economy, tax and trade related, and then the inconsistencies that are now seen into the final um, reporting systems. So that is one of the ways. The second one is statistical. This is more direct and it looks at IFS type or source. So this is more detailed and the data is more reliable because it is direct data. And of course, with this, there is more potential for political buy-in. Now, with that in mind, let's look at some of the processes that are used. With the methodologies we've just talked about, we look at an example of one of the biggest partnerships when it comes to measuring and uh, predicting IFFs, which is between UNODC and the UNCTAD. Now, with this, it looks at how the IFF methodologies should be integrated with a country's statistical and tax system. For example, if a country is looking at tax and trade related IFFs, does, does the, methodology, the methodologies we've talked about, for example, the econometrical and statistical, which makes more sense in, in a situation of tax and trade related IFFs. And after it fits with that, does it then fit to the country system? So that is what it looks at. And finally, when you're using the UNODC uh, and the UNCTAD framework, is it applicable to their conceptual framework of how they have classified IFFs? And of course, again, the conceptual framework can be found on the, uh, as a link on the PowerPoint. So you can look at that more. And with that in mind, it's their process is in six steps and the criteria for selecting the, the process you use is looking at the soundness of data. So at the end of the process, is there capacity in that country to go with either the econometrical statistical methodology or any other methodology that works for you? And finally, will there be data available? And how regular will it be? Of course, we talked about if the data is irregular or not there, we have a lot of marginal errors when it comes to estimating IFFs. So, you can look at the process here and I would like to point out the key things here is they first conduct pilot studies and then they look at the talent, the capacity of the people who will be conducting this process and finally assessing the risks and the availability of data. So these first three steps are able to now ensure that the IFFs are measured well and finally, they are tested, validated, and published. And 
we encourage that we get more and more IFF related data. So there's the sharing, learning and improving on methods. And this is always an important step, but this is not a method that is foolproof because when it comes to the UNCTAD and UNODC measures, there is a presence of overlaps and double counting in the measurements. So that is something to look out for. And of course, there is the fact that it does not estimate national IFFs, for example, corruption. It looks at the more general uh, IFFs, for example, uh, the ones that cross borders, arms trading, etc. And uh, Lila has, of course, recommended a book that you can look more on what other people have talked about when it comes to measuring and pre predicting IFFs. Now, we look at the other area of the measurement and prediction measures on IFFs, which is in terms of indicators in a country. And we look at the macroeconomic one first and then go to the governance. And I welcome you to watch, uh, to watch the video that Leila has, has, has on the Padlet, which is on the cost of gold. And the main point of it is that because of the, the environment that developing countries have, they are more susceptible to human rights abuses um, and corruption by big corporations. Because of course, apart from gold, we can also talk about fast fashion. We can talk about uh, UV batteries. You see, uh, production is done in cheap countries because of course, these people can lobby governments uh, and then um, commit IFFs and human rights related abuses in such scenarios. Another is the governance indicators. Under the governance indicators, here we are looking at how stable a country is. And the World Bank has given six key indicators. The key indicators given are corruption, government effectiveness, corruption control in this case, government effectiveness, political stability, rule of law, regulatory quality, voice and accountability. And of course, this is not to say that a country should, should have all this in order, but having steps towards how to correct each one of them. And in many cases, you'll find that they are linked. So OECD also uh, states that high levels of corruptions are combined with weak institutions and sometimes illegitimate uh, regimes. So these are big drivers of illicit financial flows. And of course, Mbeki 20, 2014 report addressed the illicit financial flows and talked about framing them within a political considerations context uh, and this is because you'll, no, you'll notice, for example, as said in the or as stated in the video on on the cost of on the cost of gold, we'll see that multinational companies lobby governments in the form of political campaign contributions to either implement policies or not. And with this in mind, then we have a, a case of South Africa, which is relatively uh, peaceful, uh, has high economic growth and value, but that does not mean there is a decrease of illicit financial flows. So political stability is not really correlated with the decrease of illicit financial flows. But if, uh, I, I mean, political stability is a key indicator or, or a key uh, a key indicator of how much a government can have uh, illicit financial flows. But good governance is really not, because you can have good governance, but multinational corporations are abusing, um, are abusing the rights of people in that country. So with that in mind, you can see how these indicators might also be used to have uh, data on different countries. Now, when we talk about 
what the impact of human rights are, we see that international organizations such as the UN came up with SDGs, which were supposed to now look into tackling IFFs. And we see that IFFs causes a big drain on foreign exchange reserves and reduces tax revenue, which now uh, results into financing of social welfare is either low or not there at all. And we see in this example where the goal 16 was specific to peace, justice, and strong institutions. We've already talked about how fragile uh, institutions in a country impact highly, how much illicit financial flows will affect that country. So with that in mind, we'll look into a case of where IFFs have really impacted uh, a country. And the first case is the Luanda Leaks. And I think I'll welcome us to watch this video. Let me know if the volume is clear. Isabel dos Santos was the daughter of a president of an autocratic country, and she made a lot of money because of that. A whole swathe of service providers, bankers, lawyers, the oil companies, consultants have allowed the extraction of the resources that belong to the Anglo people from their country western capitals where this money gets reinvested. A small elite has been able to keep a stranglehold over the resources of the country, use them to their benefit. Isabel dos Santos' business background is her father's presidential decrees and her father's power. You had always the state providing the financial cover with the political cover for her. Isabel's commercial presence in Angola is only presence. Those who use cell phones go through the company which she has in shares, Unitel. In banks that are everywhere, then when you talk about construction cement, there's an orchestrated attack by the current government that is completely politically motivated. My holdings are commercial. There are no proceeds from uh, contracts or public contracts or might have been deviated from public funds. Now, with that, you'll hear language like 
there was no money deviated from the public funds. There were no secret contracts. When it comes to the legality of it, looking at it, you might find that, you know, it might be illegal, but again, you've had that. There was that connection between one individual with the government. So even as we talk about multinational corporations, we are not only looking at people who have uh, companies in the Western or Eastern regions, and then we say, oh, no, it's just people from outside. We also have to look at what's in the African continent as well. And so another is we are looking at, apart from the, the human resources from that country that would have benefited people very well that are now lost. We also see another case of she's not doing it only in Africa. There are other countries outside there and that the, the, the beneficial ownership uh, comes in. Yes, and what does it even mean to Africa's richest woman but now in Golden Prosecute may be issuing international warrant for her arrest? I would like to think that my parents formed who I am as a person, but my professional choices and the risks I have taken and the businesses I have built and created were done by my own vision and by my own will. But did she really? She's been accused of robbing Angola of billions. The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists has spent the last eight months verifying more than 7,000 documents dubbed the Rwanda leaks. Here are five things. As the daughter of former Angolan President Jose Eduardo de Santos, Isabel de Santos was awarded lucrative public contracts and licenses because of her connections. In everything from diamond exports, a mobile network, one of Angola's largest banks, media, and construction. Santos and her husband, Zendika de Colo, have reportedly made some shady deals. De Santos was appointed chairperson of Sunango, Angola's state owned oil company, while her father was president. But when he resigned, she was sacked and $58 million transfer was made to a consulting firm in Dubai for unspecified services. It turns out that the company is actually owned by a friend. Santos has also come under scrutiny for husband's Swiss jewelry company to Chris Ogono, partially financed by the state, which has become known for its lavish annual parties on the French Rivera. The company is now running at a loss. Santos and her family are living the high life with a $55 million mansion in Monte Carlo, a $35 million yacht, and luxury residences in Dubai, London, and Lisbon. This is a stark contrast to the average person in Angola, where more than 40% of the population live under the poverty line. Despite the country's rich oil and diamond resources, there's high infant mortality and low literacy rates. The Attorney General of Angola claims that DeSantis and her husband are responsible for more than $1 billion in lost state funds. But if they did rob Angola, they didn't do it without help. Some of the world's leading professional service firms reportedly helped her. Boston Consulting Group McKinsey and PricewaterhouseCoopers all worked closely with the couple, providing key advice on how to structure their business dealings. Isabel de Santos has denied the charges and she says it's all part of a politically motivated witch hunt. But the Rwanda leaks paint a very different story. Right, very interesting stuff there. And you can already see how the impact of that one case has on the population of that country. So moving on to the overall idea of Angola, it's not only this one situation. Angola has also had uh, civil wars, and we can even say that that is one of the main problems. But we, we can see how IS has been affecting this country and the channels are many in which the outflows are taking place. Because for example, we can see uh, billions of dollars in oil revenues illegally bypassed Angola Central Bank and disappeared without explanation, even without the case of this particular uh, individual who is Isabel. So of course there are efforts to cover efforts, and these efforts are both policy-wise and institutional efforts to cover efforts. We'll start with the report on the high-level panel. So the idea of the panel was to report on the idea of the report was to 
to reflect the work that the panel had been doing. And the crucial aspect that was seen was transparency, because of course, transparency would ensure that all the financial and tax information needed, the public participation measures and the government measures also were publicly um, accessible to people. And so some of the key things that arose from that was that there was need to develop a realistic and accurate assessment of volumes and sources of these outflows, and also understanding how outflows occur in Africa, making specific recommendations of practical, realistic, short to medium actions that should be taken by Africa and the rest of the world. So, a keynote here is the practicality of it and the short to medium term actions, mostly because when it comes to such agreements, the language tends to be the language tends to be so broad such that most of these instruments uh, don't actually have any impact. So another one is the UN FACTI panel. And the point of the FACTI panel was looking at financial integrity when it comes to sustainable development. So one of the issues that you'll note with all these um, policy policy issues is that not everyone agrees with them because when it comes to the FACTI panel, of course, there, there were themes of secrecy and ensuring justice in it. And of course, the seizure of stolen assets. But the, the objective was to fill a gap in the regulatory architecture of the UN. But at the time of of the UN FACTI panel being put in place, many said that it was just duplicating other efforts such as the UN Convention Against Corruption and the Financial Action Task Force. So that is also something to note into how all these policies may have their, their, their efforts uh, hindered when it comes to having every stakeholder uh, participate Another is the institutional, and here we are looking at the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, whose main, main focus was to tackle tax evasion and corruption. So when it comes to the Addis Ababa Agenda, many said that it does not contain practical actions. So it's, it's committing, inviting uh, different, different efforts, but not really having the implementable steps towards it. So another was it failed to reaffirm human rights and how those were going to be to be implemented, such as the International Labor Organization conventions. Another is the Financial Action Task Force. And this task force looks at the banking system and financial institutions. But the main problem with it is it did, it did have unintended consequences, such as when it comes to classification of countries, poor countries may be affected negatively because when it comes to the gray list classification aspect of it, it now causes nonprofits that are promoting human rights to be classified as a risky uh, measure, or uh, I mean, a risky institution, rather than taking them how uh, they do with corporations, which they, the risk is dependent on how a particular corporation acted. So those are some of the aspects you might find when it comes to the current efforts that are being uh, taken. Another is, of course, by the OECD and it has to do with transparency and exchange of information. And the, the key issue that had to do with this is that it does not respect the rule of law when it comes to countries. And this is in terms of the coexistence of plural legal orders when it comes to the domestic boundaries. And some of the countries that were affected were such as Switzerland and Portugal, who had to the law to the law to remove their, 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 
and their ability to challenge cross-border. It comes to the protection of taxpayers. And the key, the key note here was it, is cite, it cited that the disclosure could be done in urgent cases. Again, how do you measure which is an urgent case and what is not urgent? So the information from a taxpayer might end up being given out without uh, their notification either way. So other efforts we see are repatriation. And uh, an older case is the one from Nigeria in 1999 when they tried to get their money back. But out of the 3 billion that was lost, only 5 or 4 million was able to be recovered. And this was after a long process, so many years later. And with countries that have no revenue and huge gaps in their budgets in the first place, this the, the repatriation effect, uh, uh, efforts are not really advantageous to them in the long run. And so even in the case of Dos Santos, of course, there were, there were calls to have her assets frozen and seized by the country. And of course, Portugal helped in this scenario, but there were also other concerns because they could not have stopped her from selling some of her shares in the Portuguese companies. So you can freeze assets at a certain point and you can seize them, but they still room uh, to close some loopholes. Now, another, another um, case is sanctioning non-state actors. We had uh, an example of the middleman and the lawyer when it came to the diagram showing how money laundering works. And in this case, uh, a, 21 case, a 2021 case of the Patisari Valerie case, we had the accountants uh, sanctioned in this case, both the firm and the auditor. So what happened is that the accounting measures were not done appropriate, appropriately and they were setting incompetence and some of the uh, some of the things that came from that case was that the Patisserie Valerie chain was not communicating with their, their accountants. And on the other hand, the accountants were not asking for more information, doing their due diligence when it came to the different bank and cash uh, accounting that they had to consolidate. So they, of course they were reprimanded and they had prohibition from carrying out statutory audits. And this was the auditor and partner of Grant Thornton. This was the company uh, in charge of the, of the Patisari Valerie account. And the company itself, not the auditing company, was also sanctioned with 2.34 million euros non-financial sanctions of mostly monitoring and reporting. And both of them had to have declarations. Of Sorry, Varita, just to interrupt, oh. your talk is really, really interesting. But you have five minutes to wind up, please. Oh, yes, yes, I'm done. So Finally, we have the actors and motivators. So throughout the presentation, we've talked about different people and how they interact with each other. And some of the issues of facing IFFs, we can say that uh, there is no victim. But at the end of the day, when we look at how the activities come about, you always find there's always a direct or indirect victim. So with that in mind, it's always good to look forward to now the next session with Leila, which deals with more of how non-state actors uh, impact IFFs. Thank you very much. Arita, you can take over. Thank you very much, Yavarita. That was quite a handful. Oh, really, really good. Yes. Uh, Laila? Can we take a few questions? Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, colleagues, 
Kindly, if you'd like to ask questions, we can take two to three online and the rest you can chat. You can put it in the chat box. Questions, kindly, if you have, please raise up your hands or just throw them directly to Verita. Yes, so, so Ismail yeah, has a question. 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 Can human trafficking be part of the illegal financial flows since it is also a resource? Yes, yes. So human trafficking falls under the criminal activities classified under IFFs. It is a part of IFFs. Thank you, Varita. Another question? Yes, uh, Laila has also a suggestion for you, Ismail. The UN ODC has lots of reports on human trafficking. Indeed. Um, so if I may just say something, Please. I think the, the webinar in itself was focused for lawyers, especially because in this claim, that we lawyers, um, for us who among us, the participants who are lawyers, the claim is that lawyers are those professionals who facilitate illicit financial flows. Now, some lawyers have been accused of doing this willingly, knowingly that they are engaging in illicit transfer of funds. While there are other lawyers, because they do not have the knowledge of how the institutions can be manipulated in such a way, they are being utilized as tools by criminals or other players to help them to, to launder their money through these institutions. So some lawyers are doing this, but they're not aware that what they're doing is actually facilitating illicit financial flows. So the next sessions that we'll be considering um, the enabling environment, the role of lawyers and the red flags are particularly targeted to understand how law and lawyers utilize the legal framework to facilitate illicit financial flows. So this, the, the presentation by Warida has been really accurate. It's been on spot to provide everyone with an overview and sort of a background understanding of what really IFFs are the different forms of IFFs, corporate, ev corporate tax evasion, criminal aspects of IFFs, the corruption, uh, you know, related uh, flows that are either brought in by politicians or multinational corporations and ethically and illicitly that form part of this wider IFF framework. We've got the problem with the metaverse right now, which is also facilitating IFFs. Talk about the deep web and dark web. There's a lot that's going on in the domain of IFFs. And this presentation, the session one, was just to provide you with a bird's eye view of what really this, this, uh, this environment looks like. What, who are the main players? who are the policy makers and what sort of policies are out there to try and curb these illicit financial flows. So I really do hope that you've had the good background, um, like a short, sharp course, understanding about IFFs. There's a lot of reading that uh, we will make available for you. On the Padlet, we have identified some key readings that are going to be helpful for you to understand really the problem of IFFs. But going forward, we're specifically focusing on lawyers, and uh, the role that they play uh, to, to influence this IFF environment. But this is what I'd like to say. Of course, we will have uh, this session is being recorded, and the recording will be placed on the Padlet as well for you to access throughout. Um, yes. So if there are any other questions, please ask now, or we can just go ahead and start with the next presentation. Parita? Yes. Uh, thank you, Laila. Again, back to the chat. To what extent is money printing a conduit to illegal financial flows? And Rarita has actually said money printing is illegal. The Nugen asked kindly comment on trade-based money laundering under commercial activities. Uh, um, yes. Okay, go on. Uh, Lila, I'll just add on the, on the money printing one, and you can kindly take the trade-based one. Okay. So when we look at money printing, first we have to understand that some of the things used to print money can be bought legally, but others have to be uh, bought on the 
you know, shadow economy, the black market kind of thing, so illegal. And at the end of the day, money printing in itself is an illegal activity. And so through looking at those steps and finally looking at how this uh, illegal money or fake money will be used in the illicit economy, we find that there are various steps in which it will traverse between being legal and being used illegally. Thank you. Absolutely. And that's one of the greatest forms of IFF, particularly in countries that are part of the conflict zones, is a lot of illegal money that is being printed out, shifted across borders to countries where we have criminal networks and terrorist organizations relying on this money to buy arms and traffic people as well. This money is also being traded on the dark web, especially in terms of purchasing of bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies to continue facilitating this growing criminal enterprise. Um, not to just to discuss this in great de detail, but we will have a specific course on digital taxation and also looking at the role of the digital economy in creating uh, hidden economies within the, the web through which this illicit uh, cryptocurrency transactions are occurring. So if there is interest, please do look out for the next training on this particular item. Now, Eugene, you've asked a question on trade-based money laundering under commercial activities. When we think about trade-based um, illicit financial flows, what comes to mind is this aspect of transfer pricing. Um, I will share with you uh, our training videos on transfer pricing and the manner in which transfer mispricing is associated as part of trade related money laundering activities, if you like. Um, they're also available on the Padlet. We ran this session about three weeks ago. The other forms of trade based uh, IFFs are you have this concept of invoicing and Warida touched on this a bit lightly. So when you manipulate your invoicing, either you, know, you falsify those invoices, um, you have to export invoices and you underestimate them, you overestimate them, that's part of illicit finance. You're earning extra money not declaring the true estimate of what you've earned to the government. So that extra that you've earned because of under or over invoicing, you've got to be able to either shift it out of the country and taxed as profits, or you've got to bring it back into the system by the process of what Warida described as placement, layering, and integration, a classic money laundering scheme. So there's again a, a report by the Global Financial Integrity GFI report. They have uh, an exclusive report on trade-based money laundering um, uh, yeah, trade-based money laundering in Africa, and they've looked at data from 2001 all the way up to 2010. Some of it goes up to 2018. So if that's of interest, please look at the GFI website, uh, trace the report, and you have a fantastic understanding of how this is also occurring um, in that field. So Steve, a fantastic contribution. Ethics do play a role. I think even our professional ethics have to come into play. And we will be looking at the next uh, the, the session tomorrow on the advocate client privilege, the duty of confidentiality as part of our ethics on whether and to what extent do we have a duty to the government, to the state and to a client in, uh, in the fight against illicit financial flows. So tax literacy, understanding what IFFs are, how they are characterized, how they move, how they are transferred across institutions or institutionalized pathways is to make illegal funds legal, that sort of education will really have a positive impact on reducing um, the IFF practice in Africa and of course globally as well. Uh, Warida, do you have anything else to add? No, thank you. So Muthoni, you say you understand that the definition of IFFs is wide and not well decided on, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering, especially in relation to cooperation and multinationals, where do you draw the line between IFFs and exploiting comparative advantages of different countries through favorable jurisdiction shopping, example, Ireland corporations, Delaware corporations, and some so-called tax havens? 
Muthoni, this is precisely the problem. This is exactly the enabling environment that is making it very difficult to curtail the fight against IFFs. There's a problem here because we've got laws that are very ambiguous, and these laws are being interpreted by professionals, ourselves, lawyers, and auditors, and other related parties, how they decide to interpret the law to, 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 to make legal what is unethical, because the, the, the line between what is illegal and legal is very clear. Right, tax evasion is illegal, tax avoidance is not. But then there's a dispute about tax avoidance. Some say it's illegal, some say, hey, it's a tax planning scheme, it is permissible. Most of our income tax legislation supports the idea of tax planning schemes. Where do we draw the line, right? It's a really difficult situation because the regime of bilateral investment agreements on one hand, we've got double taxation agreements on the other hand, we've got trade-based agreements uh, on the third tier, we've got regional integration that comes up with its own either tax harmonization policies or tax differentiation or differentiational policies. So it's really difficult to be able to place a finger and say, where do we draw the line? Right? The line is to be drawn by a clearer definition of what constitutes illicit financial flows. And if you look at the major definitions that are out of that out there, none of these definitions are actually pointing to the enabling environment as part and parcel of IFs. Should we do that, then we're able to resolve many of these problems that we have. In the chat box, I had alluded to a report by the United Nations Office of the Special Advisor on Africa. There was a study done in, in terms of uh, intensifying the fight against corruption and money laundering. Uh, there's a particular section in that report that touches the debate on defining and redefining, recharacterizing the definition of IFFs, which would be important for you to look at and then have this debate going further. So um, that is my contribution to some of the questions that have been raised. And uh, we have, uh, I think Ismail has his hand up. Ismail. Yes, can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, I have a, I have a quote from a very famous, infamous person, it's historically Benito Mussolini. He once said that uh, uh, democracy is made up of corporate and uh, government officials. So we've been leaning on the side of corporate a lot. How about the government at large? What role do they play? How do they come to come together with the corporates to increase or insinuate these uh, IFF activities all across the group? Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Warida, do you want to take that? Please repeat the last part of the question. I was not able to hear it well. So basically, he's saying that our focus has been on corporations, right? That they are the dead actors involved in IFs. But we're forgetting the other limb of the actors who are government officers. So what do we have to say about them? Are they involved as part of the IFF network? Yes, definitely. So as you've said, uh, especially in the last slide, we've talked about how government officials also partake in some of these initiatives. So with that, what we talk about is now having enough data. So with enough data, we are able to see which, uh, which are the channels that, you know, politi political uh, actors, and with other uh, international initiatives and the fact that the public can also participate and get to know how IFFs is affecting them and how important it is to, to know this. They are able to keep the government officials in check. So you'll notice in most things like how, um, how transparent a government is depends on how much the citizens are pushing for accountability and transparency and trying to uh, keep uh, the government officials in check. So this is uh, one of the ways. And I think if there's anything I've missed out, Leila, please add. In fact, yes, we should wrap up the session now. 
And I think uh, Lanmore has put it very clearly in the chat box that political elites indeed, um, where did it go? Are at the center of illicit financial flows. I mean, corruption starts at the high level, at the executive level, and it's rampant in the extractive industries where we've seen government officials get involved with multinational corporations to get kickbacks, to give them procurement contracts, and then also get involved in the exportation of some of these minerals to which they are um, beneficiaries. So Daniel Magnassi, um, very good question. And if you're going to be joining us tomorrow, um, session that we have, session three on the role of lawyers deals with exactly the question that you have asked. It's more of a practical example of how lawyers are actually getting this thing done. So please join us tomorrow to get some sort of a practical example of how this works in, in reality. Um, so thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Wajda, for your presentation, giving us that context on the introduction to IFFs. I think without much further ado, for the next uh, 20 minutes, not more, um, I'm going to discuss with you the enabling environment. Um, and I'll share my slides with you right now. Great. So if I may have an indication, can, can you all see my slides? But uh, Wajda is clear. Yeah, perfect. Yes. All right. Okay. So this is the this is the genesis of illicit financial flows. It's all about the uh, the enabling environment, right? So our earlier session, and this is me repeating myself, was on introduction to IFFs provided. Uh, this this sorry this this introduction to IFF. The session that we've just had provided us with the background that we needed to now dig deeper into the enabling environment that. Um, fosters illicit financial flows. So, right. So what is this enabling environment? That's our focus right now. The enabling environment is what fosters or facilitates illicit financial flows, right? This enabling environment is created through the utilization of institutions, actors, the legal framework and corporate legal vehicles. Now let's examine each aspect in turn. And let's start with institutions. Now institutions can facilitate illicit financial flows if they are left unregulated. These institutions, they exist at the national and international level. Right. So think of banks and other financial institutions, which are characterized as international financial centers, offshore financial centers, tax havens or secrecy jurisdictions. Even cross border regional private equity firms, these institutions can be formal or informal. We have to be very clear about this. Right. So they are formal when they are legally set up and regulated by the government or another supervisory body. They are informal when they are set up to respond to society's needs by private unregulated actors in the absence of a regulator or as less costly alternatives such as the Hawala sector guided by social legal norms. So when you have a population that does not have bank accounts but are in need of finances, and remitting them elsewhere, they will turn to the informal sector where they can access Hawala traders or use mobile banking to move funds. So this sector, the Hawala and mobile banking, if not properly regulated, can result in the use of money mules by criminals to launder money. And money mules, if you may ask, are ordinary people who are selected by criminals to deposit and transfer black money on behalf, uh, on their behalf for a commission. Now, as we talk about institutions, they can, these institutions can be legal, illegal, or they can give the illusion of legitimacy. And that's where the problem is with lawyers and IFFs. Now, legal institutions, we all know, Barclays Bank, Stan Big Bank, um, London Stock Exchange, Nairobi Securities Exchange, and for example, the Nordic Investment Bank in Finland, right? Illegal institutions are those that are set up as part of the hidden or underground economy through which money laundering takes place 
and the dark web interface is one such model that facilitates the existence of these illegal institutions. There are also instances where private bankers can abuse their powers and use the banking sector to quietly move money for politically exposed people, persons, politicians, or corrupt state officers in an attempt to conceal the illicit nature of the money. So when it goes through a bank, it gives such money the illusion of legitimacy because the assumption is that the bank has done all its checks before moving the money as part of the know your customer rules. So let's move on to the actors now, right? So the enabling environment is made up of institutions. The next part is about actors. The actors who facilitate illicit financial flows are state actors. This is where Ismail, you asked the question, right? Like Abache, the former Nigerian president, Dos Santos, the former Angolan president, as was made evidence following the Luanda leaks or the government officers involved in the Goldenberg scandal during the regime of Kenya's second president, or those officials who are involved in the big loans scandal not so long ago. Now, the actors facilitating illicit financial flows can also be non-state actors. And now these are individuals like you and I, right? We create schemes to evade taxation. So for example, you know, engaging in uh, what we call the missing trader scheme to reduce VAT. In Kenya, uh, the Kenya Revenue Authority has already lost a billion in VAT tax evasion because traders decided to set up multiple ghost companies to issue false invoices of goods that were never delivered and services that were never offered, but they filed returns to claim deductions from VAT, which was reported. Now, non-state actors, also private corporations involved in, pay, in paying bribes to win government procurement contracts. For example, we have, um, uh, which is the listen? Samharji, the Icelandic seafood giant that bribed senior Namibian officials and politicians to get lucrative fishing quotas and to avoid paying taxes. This scandal was actually exposed by the fish rot scandal reported by an organization called Fair Planet, which is an independent journalism and activism platform. So professionals are also responsible for facilitating illicit financial flows, right? Mossack Fonseca, that was the law firm at the center of the Panama Papers scandal. Grant Thornton, an audit firm, basically just made up a load of accounting entries to produce the results they wanted for their clients which was to substantially reduce their tax liability. They thought they, 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 would, uh, they would get away with this, right? But their audit was reviewed and discrepancies were found. They were taken to court. Now, actors, um, be they public and private or private, they do facilitate illicit flows. The International Consortium of uh, uh, investigating journalists is the ICIJ. They have reported how senior banking officials allow criminals to launder their dirty money by simply failing to report suspect transactions. If you're the manager of a bank, you have a duty to report suspect transactions. If you choose not to suspect, you choose not to report those suspected transactions, who's going to hold you liable? right? Because you have that oversight responsibility and you are abusing it. So that's where you have private bankers as, professional, uh, as professionals who are facilitating illicit financial flows. So sometimes um, these uh, state and non-state actors work together especially in regions that are in conflict, have weak regulations, and there is rampant corruption. So lawyers and bankers then work together to conceal the illicit wealth of their clients, particularly clients who are government officers. 
right? So what the lawyers do, they set up, classic example, they set up shell companies and ask the banker to open an account for the shell company and deposit the client's money. The client isn't named among the company's directors. The company's directors are instead uh, nominees who are supplied by the lawyer. Or the lawyer will set up um, an offshore company in such a way that it is owned by another offshore company. And that offshore company will in turn sign a declaration of trust or a power of attorney granting control to the client. The only people who will know the identity of the client are the bank and the lawyer. And sometimes the company registration agents, since there is now a need to declare beneficial ownership. We will discuss this a bit more in tomorrow's session. Um, beneficial ownership can be countered by the private banker who can create a technique called hold mail for the client. Now, through this technique, the client can request that no documentation whatsoever is sent by the bank to his home address if the client hasn't declared his account in his home country. So the client can open you know, multiple accounts and keep some very confidential. This technique avoids creating a paper trail and the authorities in the client's home country won't be alerted to the existence of an otherwise invisible account. Now, the enabling environment does not only comprise of actors working individually or by themselves. These actors are part of an interactive network. And uh, the Sahel example, right, uh, kind of gives us a good illustration. So Sahel is that part of, uh, of uh, the northern part of Africa, you know, Mauritania, Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad, that's the strip. Um, the cycles of conflict in the Sahel have created uh, displacement fragility and insecurity. These are, this is the environment that's needed for IFFs to thrive anyway, right? The Sahel region has opened up spaces for insurgencies to develop into violent extremism and enabled elite resource capture, grand corruption and impunity. Putting the control of borders and movement across it in the hands of armed or terrorist groups who are part of an interactive network involving corrupt state officials and multinational corporations who use these armed groups as conduits to transfer minerals out of the Sahel region. So the Group 5, G5, um, Sahel Joint Force, and the Sahel Alliance was an organization launched in 2017. It is supported by the European Union and the United Nations Counter, Counter Terrorism Center under the framework of its global border security mechanism. This G5 organization has not been able to effectively secure the Sahel border, nor prevent the movement of illicit cargo. This is because their focus has been on containing local conflicts, right? So you're, 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 you're distracted in terms of ensuring there's peace and stability in the region, and you're not focused on tracking the smuggling of weapons, drugs, fuel, cattle, rustling, poaching, preventing the alliance of terrorists across borders, right? So you don't focus on the commercial aspects of illicit financial flows insofar as the minerals are concerned in the Sahel region. So illicit movement of gold for example, in this region is facilitated by the absence of or weak levels of governance, high levels of corruption and the existence of black markets alongside a population that is actually happy to informally mine gold and exchange it for basic necessities across borders. And sometimes women are used as conduits to move gold across the border, securing their belief that their cultural customs will prevent their inspection at the border. 
It's a Muslim woman all covered up. Why would you want to search me, right? So this is how non-state actors, particularly women, are also facilitating illicit financial flows. So let's now turn to the legal framework. And uh, during our question and answer session, after um, Warida's session, we touched a little bit about the law. Now, this is all about how national laws and international agreements are drafted and implemented. If the laws are ambiguous, if they are unclear, if they confer discretion to ministers, then these laws can be abused or utilized to facilitate illicit financial flows or justify legal interpretations that favor acts or omissions that erode the tax base. And I'm going to give you a very recent example. And I know Mohammed Bu is here with us. He was also here with me in the session yesterday with East Africa Law Society. We were, we were discussing some aspects of the common external tariffs. This is the example I want to give. So the common external tariffs is a new law um, that was recently passed by the East Africa community. It is now being implemented by every East Africa member state. Under this law, all imports into the East Africa region of goods and products attract a tax rate ranging from 0% all the way up to maximum of 35%. So milk, rice, wheat, sugar, bird, it's all taxed at 35%. Now, let's single out Tanzania. Tanzania is part of the East Africa community. It's also part of SADAC, Southern African Development Corporation states, right? Southern Africa. Now, assume a business wants to import wood into Kenya. This would attract 35% under the CET 2022 legislation. Now, He's your client. He doesn't want to pay the 35%. And you know very well that the Sadak region, Southern Africa region, they export wood. Now, if your client is to import wood from a Sadak state, from maybe South Africa, Botswana, he would have to pay 35%. So as a lawyer, you advise your client to set up a company in Tanzania and then buy wood to the Tanzanian company from the Sadak region, right? Because Tanzania is part of Sadak. Then import the wood to Kenya from the Tanzania company, effectively avoiding the 35%. So this legal advice is based on a reading of the common external tariff law and taking advantage of regional double blocks. Is it illegal? You need to think about it. Are lawyers therefore facilitating illicit financial flows by giving such advice? I don't know. We really have to debate this out because this is business. This is how we add money. Is it ethical? Debatable. Now, the last part of the enabling environment that I want to bring to your attention are corporate vehicles. These are legal structures through which business is conducted and uh, transactions are facilitated. They are of various forms and uh, each can be used to facilitate um, illicit financial flows, of course, if utilized for that purpose. Now, corporate vehicles, for example, uh, comprise of trusts, foundations, companies, partnerships, private equity firms, ETC, hedge funds, etc. Now, these vehicles provide a range of commercial activities, including the control and movement of wealth and assets as part of the financial system. These structures, the companies, foundations, partnerships, etc., they're legal structures and they can be used to conceal true ownership, right? Shift untaxed profits offshore and also erode the source state tax base simply by applying tax planning schemes. I earlier said almost all income tax laws recognize tax planning schemes as legal as utilized for tax evasion purposes. Now, the most common method 
for partnerships and companies to actually um, avoid taxation and uh, generate you know, illicit financial flows is transfer mispricing, which refers to manipulating the arm's length principle. That is how you, know, you have related companies or subsidiaries price their goods and services between themselves, and the price does not really reflect the market value. It is also how corporate vehicles are structured so as to take advantage of moving into a jurisdiction which has low or, or basically no tax rates, right? And then they shift their profits there. A classical example is the Zambia Associated Foods, right? Uh, in this particular case, um, and I have to share the link with you, um, which is a report that was done by UN AIDS. Um, so a company was set up in Zambia. This company borrowed money from its Dutch subsidiary in Netherlands. The, the Dutch subsidiary then borrowed money from its Irish subsidiary. Now, the double taxation agreement between Netherlands and Ireland stated that there would be no interest on the loan if borrowed for development purposes. So the, 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 the Dutch company borrowed money from the Irish company. The Irish company gave that loan the Dutch company, and then the Dutch company loans the money to the Zambian company. A lot of crisscrossing going on at an interest rate. So it's borrowed the money without interest rate, but it's lending the money to its own subsidiary at an interest rate. And it's going to now utilize the, the, the uh, sources from Zambia to earn money and then pay that interest, right? Big discussion here. Now, Zambia pays back the loan with interest. And now the Zambia Dutch DTA states, interest is not to be taxed at source. So Zambia cannot deduct tax on the interest that it is paying. Thin cap rules do not apply here. The Dutch company actually makes a profit by receiving the interest payment, especially since that interest payment is not taxed in Zambia. It will also not be taxed in Netherlands because of the, the Dutch Irish double taxation treaty. So here, are companies that were, that were actually set up in jurisdictions that were conducive for investment and DTAs were used to limit and reduce the tax liability, right? Zambia lost revenue through round tripping and profit shifting based on the classical double Irish Dutch sandwich paradigm. Okay, so um, hedge funds, yeah. Hedge funds, and about to conclude, hedge funds also play a role in corporate tax evasion. Um, corporate tax evasion is, of course, a form of illicit financial flows, as was explained to you. Now, the way in which a hedge fund works is by operating a 2 and 20 compensation structure or some other variation. It could be 2 and 50, yeah, 2 and 50, 2 and 20. Generally, it's 2 and 20. This 2 and 20 structure simply means that the management fee to be paid is 2% and the performance fee to be paid is 20%. So the hedge fund manager charges a flat 2% management fee, which is based on the value of the total amount of assets in the fund. Um, the performance fee is a percentage of the profits realized under the hedge fund management. Now, when it comes to the payment of management fees and performance fees, this is where the trick is. These payments are pegged on interest that is received as part of the return on investment. Very legal, very, it, it's just business as usual. So for tax purposes, because payment is made based on return on investment, it is taxed as capital gains and not salary. So here, lawyers actually advise their high net worth individuals to set up perhaps hedge funds become fund managers and pay themselves out of their profits, which are based on interest payments and which will not be taxed as salary or dividends, but only as capital gains. So if this was happening in Kenya, right? Capital gains in Kenya is 5%. So what you're earning, you're simply paying 5% tax compared to paying 30% if you are charged as uh, if, if, you're, if the money that you received has been charged as income. So this is a significant tax 
tax saving scheme for the hedge fund, right? It is not illegal. It is purely legal and it is acceptable under the Income Tax Act and companies law. But this can become part of illicit financial flows when hedge funds are set up by money launderers and other criminals to place and layer and integrate illicit proceeds to wash their black money through the use of lawfully registered companies. Dirty money is then channeled into the country and simply meager taxes are paid on it. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, this brings me to the end of the second session. The objective here was to describe to you the enabling environment that facilitates illicit financial flows so that you can have sort of a, a bird's eye view of it. Session three tomorrow, we will go further into the role of lawyers and explain the points uh, at which they become enablers of illicit financial flows either willingly or unwittingly, right? So um, the floor is now open for your questions. And I probably leave it at uh, Parita to guide. Thank you very much, Laila. This was also a very eye-opening uh, session and uh, people are also appreciating both Varida and yourself. And I've seen a question, there's something in the, by the way, Laila, now it is 15%, the capital gains tax. Oh, it's more 15%. Yes, yes. So Winnie, yeah, Winnie says it's a very enlightening session and she'd like to catch your thoughts on the inclusion of legal professionals as reporting institutions regarding the STR. Right, but first let me um, let me see what uh, Learn Moy is saying. He said, yes, lawyers are enablers and they call it business. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have uh, Mohamedou says that, you know, the discussion that we've had, you know, it, uh, it might not be ethical, but quite legal somehow. And I think this is where the major problem is when we're looking at lawyers getting involved in, in coming up with the legal transactions in setting up corporate structures that are you know, utilized to manipulate the system or to you know, provide institutionalized legal pathways to move illicit money and make it legal, right? So yes, the law actually allows us to do this. So it's legal, right? And we as lawyers, we're not really concerned about the ethics of situations. This is the law morality debate. Every first year law student goes through this, right? We don't give a damn about morality. Sorry for using that word. It, it just, it doesn't resonate with us. We're all about what does our client want and how do we get it for our client? That's what we do. And that's why we have a very strong advocate client legal privilege. And that's something that we will unpack tomorrow. Like to what extent do we have a duty to our client and also a duty to report right so we leave that discussion for tomorrow the heavy debate between what's legal and ethical it's, it's hard i i also don't know yeah but sometimes you're guided by your own values um so yeah uh, i'm just going to read what um winnie says Yeah, so uh, Winnie, um, there's that financial action task force recommendations that are also hoping to extend the know your customer rules to lawyers. The United Nations uh, FACTI panel, one of the recommendations that they proposed in their 2020 report is that lawyers have to be more involved in reporting uh, transactions of their clients that they feel are suspect, right? But to what extent um, are, are lawyers supposed to be involved? Where does their duty begin? Where does their duty end? So again, I would humbly request that we leave this discussion to tomorrow's session, because most of these concerns that you have, to some extent, will be clarified tomorrow. Um, so Ismail says, can it be assumed as selfishness? <laughs> Maybe, Warida, I don't know. Warida, are you a selfish lawyer? <laughs> it's a tough one. I mean, no, let's keep it to clan privilege. <laughs> that's the thing i mean i mean it's also think about it like the 
the case of Monseca, uh, Mossack Fonseca, the Panama Papers, right? You have somebody walking into your chambers with uh, three suitcases full of, uh, you know, three to four million dollars, and they're telling you, register me a company uh, and make sure the company conceals my identity. You've got four million dollars just here for you to do a little bit of paperwork, which would take about ten minutes for you to set up a company. Are you going to say no? Yeah, it's it's individual. Uh, it's about values. It's about what you deem to be um, halal or haram, as the Muslims say, or you know, legal and ethical. That that's at an individual level. How do you control lawyers? Um, first of all, lawyers are not within the regulation of the government. They have their own supervisory body, which is the Law Society of Kenya and other law societies around the world. So they are guided by the Law Society rules, not by what the government wants to do, but there's a push by the OECD for the government to create a, a supervisory body that's going to govern lawyers. And obviously, you know, the lawyers from what has been seen in the past, we'll fight against that because we do not want government intervention. We would want to remain private and, in, and independent to govern ourselves. So again, these are questions about ethics. Now, do we incorporate ethics into our practice? Uh, again, it's, um, it's, um, it's a discussion we need to keep having. Um, Mohammed, sorry, you, you sent me a direct message. I hope you don't mind me reading it out aloud. He says, is it our, our role to report anyway? Considering that we are bound by confidentiality first, this is a tremendous debate dealing with personal values and morality. Absolutely, you know, you've, you've nailed the point. I, I can't say anything more to this. And then, learn more. Oh, I don't know, you want to attack me here? What? You are not alone, guys, lawyers. Accountants, absolutely. Tax experts are hired to do tax planning or tax dodging. Indeed, so we talked about this interactive network, right? A lawyer does his part. But to, to now conceal the nonsense of the lawyer in terms of hiding illicit wealth, the auditor has to clean that up for him so that the tracing, the paper trail becomes very opaque. And at the same time, you need to have a private banker who's on board, who's actually not going to issue out the suspicious transaction reports, right? So the three work together to ensure that there's anonymity, there's opaqueness, and there's lack of transparency, therefore no accountability. So that's what drives the system, ladies and gentlemen. So um, Joelle says, I am. The motivation for the practice of some lawyers is to solely make money. Ouch. True. And part of that is generated by the advice that is given to clients, yes, including how to minimize taxes payable or facilitate IFS. Precisely the point, you're right. Where or what is the motivation for the lawyers, especially those who are yet to be convinced about the benefits of taxes to curb illicit financial flows if fighting IFFs will deprive them of the opportunity to make money? This is a tough one, to be honest, right? Because it goes back to, I think, Ismail's question about selfishness, right? Do you want to enrich in yourself, make money, have uh, the titles, the cars, the luxury life that you want to live, knowing full well that the country in which you are working is a country that is now moving towards debt distress, is, is, is moving towards uh, heavy borrowing from external parties and therefore uh, burdening every taxpayer in their country with high income taxes so that the interest payments and the capital returns on the loans can be paid to other countries. Are you okay with the fact that your country is not at par with Scandinavian countries, for example, where the education system is surprisingly very good, where like the UK, you have the national health sector that is actually functioning and providing good healthcare services. Of course, there are problems there. But this is where we have the question about the social contract, that fiscal legitimacy, your constitutional duty as a taxpayer. Do you want to be able to see your taxes generate improvement for your land, for your country, for your people? And that's the logic we need to be informed with. At Independence, the Kenyans had a very good sessional paper, African Socialism, basically African social Socialism, right? But we moved towards capitalism. We started thinking as liberal capitalists, and that kind of pushed us away from thinking 
thinking about becoming development oriented. What's the point of paying taxes? What's the point of helping your clients evade the payment of taxes when those taxes are going to contribute to the development of your country? Of course, I will hear arguments by which some of you will say, why pay taxes to a corrupt government because government is stealing that money? And that's my argument to you will be there's something called public participation. You have the right to be able to demand accountability from government and take action against those corrupt uh, individuals who have stolen the money. So you have the stolen assets recovery program headed by the World Bank to help trace this money and bring it back into the country. And you need to be able to move and have stronger judiciaries. So this is what I'd like to say. And I think um, I'd also want to give a chance to Warida and anybody else to also contribute. So please, the floor is open. Sure, I think on that last point, what I'd like to add is this. Yes, of course, the, there could be uh, another argument that is not moral on why uh, lawyers wish to look into this and also even accountants and, uh, and other professionals in this is that, let's say for instance, a, a country like Kenya, right? All the lawyers, all the accountants, decide you know what we are going to take this money for ourselves we are going to enrich ourselves and then on the other hand what happens is that the the country is unable to pay off its debt because who who is going to be able to pay taxes and of course if people living under the poverty line are not able to pay taxes now cases will increase of you know crime and so if you are living in bungalows and these rich neighborhoods that is where you'll start finding problems. And in such scenarios, the, viol the violence is too much that even the police or the military cannot protect you. So the, the country starts becoming unstable. And you decide, you know what, this is a poor country, let's move out. You, are, you as a person have a family. You love them, you'd want to, to, to make them be peaceful. But then your family also has friends, has another community that they support. What does that mean? Will, will you take a hundred or a thousand people out of the country? If so, yes, let's say all the lawyers and everyone else takes people out of their country. Do you think it will be possible to do that, to just move into another country and now start be ref being refugees in other countries? So at the end of the day, this is just a short term solution. A few people taking so much money is a short term solution to the future generations, to the current generations. So there's that also to look at. I know. So just I think the, that's, that's how I can end this. Yeah, so I think the UN Facti panel answers most of these questions that we have, right? What's the point of lawyers uh, using the law and not uh, dealing with the spirit or purpose of the law, as well as what Robert has put there, that it is parliament that creates the conducive environment through laws, um, which, which are opaque and create loopholes for lawyers to play these games. I think what the United Nations Facti Panel is proposing is to have institutions and people who are financially accountable, transparent, and people of integrity. These three values, when they are translated into how we behave, how our, our institutions are structured, to some extent in the long run, is going to start bringing about this change. Um, but it's not easy. It's going to take a lot of time but we've got to have willing players on board. The idea of the session, this webinar, is to get you to understand what these nuances are, what the challenges are, what these problems are, and then where do we go from here? So we've had an introduction on, the, on IFF, we've looked at the enabling environment. Let's move to consider now, how is it that lawyers actually facilitate illicit financial flows? And what are the kind of red flags that we need to be aware of? And then in the final session, we will leave it up for more questions and answers from yourselves and uh, take it from there. So I think uh, with this remarks, I'll hand the floor back to Parita. Yeah, Laila, just to, to give a little insight to this topic, and I'm looking at it from a total different point of view, and please correct me. There is a book by Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and we are basically looking at agriculture, minerals, which slaves, which went to Europe. However, we've totally missed out the IFF 
component there. We've looked at it from a totally historical perspective. I think as lawyers, as historians, as geographers, as accountants, we need to frame up that book on a very serious note and look at it, how we could actually say how Europe together with Africans has been underdeveloping Africa because we are still contributing to that more and more as the days go by. And it was an eye opening for me because I know lawyers really know how to twist their words, even how to quote and misquote what is given in an act, in a policy, but accountants are there to guide you to do things correctly. So when I hear that even accountants and when I even saw the TED and other things, how they help you to put your money in the wrong area and make it look as if it is really earned money without any illegal flows. I'm actually shocked and I really understand why people put their properties under the names of their wives, their bank accounts. Now I understand that. So thank you so much. But I think this is a big opportunity for us, especially this course, how we can group together with different professionals, write some great things. Let's give an opportunity to learn more. His hand is up. Learn more, the last one, learn more, please. <laughs> IFF witchcraft by <my> Europe. <laughs> no, but what about us put the adding juju to it? <laughs> yes, Lord Moore, say, go ahead. Yes. So last week we were having a, a discussion. Uh, it was more of a problem. You are using a problem tree where we wanted to find who is behind the the illicit financial flaws. And we ended up realizing that it is a human being which is at the center of all these things. So we, we agreed that maybe to a certain extent we need what we would call a total mind renewal, where we begin to think of others before we think of ourselves alone. Because we realize that whether it is smuggling, it is corruption, there is a human being who is facilitating there. So it, 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 I don't know how we can teach everybody in the world to say, guys, you need to think of others before you think of, your, of yourself. So the solution is in the hands of a human being. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Learn More, and everybody present here. Thank you very much, Varita, Laila, and again, Asante Sana to all the participants who participated. Without you, this session would not have been lively. Lively, sorry, you've contributed a great deal and given us a lot of chance for discussions and a way forward to think and to work towards totally eliminating these illegal financial flows from the blood, actually. I would call it from the blood.